have people participating really from across the country in our, in our conference today. I also want to thank our outstanding volunteer planning committee for putting this together, uh, assembling a tremendous agenda for us today, and, and really setting us off on the right foot here. Last thanks to my team. I have an amazing team here in San Antonio uh, with Maxine Guerra, our program manager for the Rio Grande Valley, Diane Tehran, who uh, I don't know if you've seen her bouncing around here today all day, but she is really in the grease that's kept these wheels moving and got this conference off the ground, so a special thanks to, to Diane. And, and, and then a special thanks to, to Jimmy Funk, who I'm sure many of you know. Uh, she's our program director here in San Antonio. She really has been leading the charge for us and the association uh, for over 20 years in San Antonio. It's just a, a wonderful resource for us and for all of those experiencing dementia. So thanks to Jimmy for her 20 years of service wherever she is. Probably the most uncomfortable time. <laughs> it is really, it's really is great to be here today, to be together in person, virtually. Because we are better together. So uh, thank you for taking time out of your day on this Saturday, I'm sure. But today's theme is that we are better together. That's one of the hallmarks of the Alzheimer's Association, and one of the things that makes me so proud to work with this organization is. The Alzheimer's Association is a convener. We bring people together. 40 years ago, a little over 40 years ago, a group of volunteers got together in a garage and said, we need to do something to improve the lives of those living with dementia and help those that are caring for them provide better care. Over time, that mission grew and grew. More groups of volunteers in basements and garages and offices all across the country came together and the Alzheimer's Association was born in communities like this, by groups like you. In May, we brought together advocates from all 50 states, went to our federal government and told them that Alzheimer's demands attention. Over the years, those efforts, those advocacy efforts have led to huge increases in funding for our cause, for our re for research for our cause. Over the last seven years since I joined, it's completely coincidental, I'm not gonna take all the credit for it, but since I joined the association in 2015, when Alzheimer's research funding from the national government or from the federal government was around $600 billion, it has now increased to what stands to be $3.5 billion next year. That is a remarkable turnaround in seven years. So thank you all for having us. Last week, we brought over 10,000 scientists together in San Diego from over 98 countries at our International Research Conference. Many from right here in San Antonio. I think that's one thing that we all should be proud of is the work that UT Health is doing. Uh, the work that Glenn Diggs Institute is doing here in town to make a difference in this disease for those living with dementia, but also for the next generation so that they don't have to experience dementia. But that's all us convening the global research community to make a difference. This fall, we'll bring together families, businesses, and concerned uh, San Antonians from all over our community for our walk down Alzheimer's which, shameless pitch, is going to be on October 15th out of the of Texas. If you haven't signed up yet, alc.org slash walk. Uh, that was for Trevor. He owes me $5 now. Uh, but also, I mean, it's, it's an opportunity for us to raise funds and awareness and show that there is a community of support out there, that we are not alone in this fight. This is a very isolating disease. When, when you are caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, you may not be able to get out of the hospital very often. This is an opportunity to walk down Alzheimer's to see that there's a community of support. Today we gather care professionals and families to provide education that betters the quality of care and the quality of life for those living with this disease. And we do this because we know that we are better together. We are stronger 
together, and together is the way that we are going to put an end to Alzheimer's disease. Thank you all for being here today. We appreciate it. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our MC. Uh, he's been our board chair for what it seems like seven years because he, he, he shepherded us through the COVID uh, years. But he's been our, our board of directors chair for the last couple of years. And he's just an all-around champion for those in our community that need care and support, whether it's Alzheimer's, dementia, or whatever the issue is. So it's my pleasure from Sage Care Management to introduce Byron Cordes. Byron. Thanks. I'm also the only one not afraid of a microphone, so they'll let me speak. I love the sound of my own voice. So, well, thank you, Greg, and thanks uh, again to the entire committee um, and to the staff, um, the, the amazing staff of the Alzheimer's Association. Can we get a round of applause? <laughs> and you know, this journey, I'm sure that's the only thing back over 20 years at the Alzheimer's Association. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so I, I do have, I do want to thank all of our um, community partners that are in the other room. Hopefully folks got breakfast. If you didn't, you're more than welcome to kind of come and go and grab some food. Um, but we do want to make sure that throughout the day you go and visit them. So please, please take a minute. Um, but we definitely want to thank the breakfast from Memory Care of Westover Hills, Karen Dooley. Yes. by their booth and say thank you. Um, with that, I do also want to say one of our community partners is the Wellmade Charitable Foundation. They do some amazing work here. They support the Alzheimer's Association like nobody's business. Um, and so I wanted to ask Tina Smith to come up and, and say a couple of words if you could. So Tina Smith with the Wellmade Charitable Foundation. Good morning, everybody. A pleasure to be here. I'm here for on behalf of our executive director, Carol Zerniel. She wasn't able to be here, but we want to thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's so important to, to gain information, uh, to learn what you can uh, about this disease and where you can go. Be sure that you visit the uh, the vendors in the, uh, the the room over there because you're not doing this by yourself. There are people out there to help you. So we want to encourage you. Uh, to, to go learn about who's out there and where you can get help. Uh, as Byron said, we are strong believers at the Wilma Charitable Foundation and the Alzheimer's Association and all the great work uh, that they do. So again, thank you very much. Enjoy your day, and we will we will see you around. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again. So quickly, just a few housekeeping. Um, obviously, please put your cell phones in stun mode so that we don't hear them. Um, that's silent for those of you not Gen Xers. You can silence your, silence your cell phones or any electronic gadgets you might have. Um, and on that, we are online. So we have, I don't know, 75 people in here. We're, probably, we're supposed to have about 150, ultimately. So if you have seats at your table, be prepared. Hopefully, you'll be filled. Um, and then we have about 300 people ultimately signed up online. So we have about 500 people, hopefully, that we're going to reach. Um, again, as Greg said, across the country. But with that comes some technical issues. We do want to thank Senior Planet, um, AARP Senior Planet, um, who are broadcasting this. So thank you guys. Um, but with that, we have some. We have some technical issues, you'll see some pop-ups. We're getting feedback, I can't hear. So, one of the issues is that these microphones are super sensitive. And so, if you can kind of keep your noise, the noise down in here, if you need to talk, if you need to take a phone call, if you can take it out. Um, and I mean, these microphones are phenomenal. Nancy, raise your hand in the back. I mean, I work with Nancy. They, they even hear you back there, I promise. So. Um, it's there, please, if you can. Um, the restrooms are out these doors and to the left, right, around and around the corner. Um, and so, for those folks that are online, if you can, I don't know where your restrooms are, you'll have to find those on, those on your own. But, um, if you can, any questions, pop those in the chat, um, and we'll be sure to get those 
uh, throughout the day. Um, if you have any other major issues online, um, please email, respond to the email that was sent to you, and, and the Alzheimer's Association will ultimately address that. Um, with that, I think I have gotten all my notes. I can barely read my own scrolls. So now it's my distinct pleasure, I hope, to introduce Dr. Alicia Parker, our, our kickoff speaker, our keynote speaker. Um, where she's an assist, assistant professor of cognitive and behavioral neurology at um, the UT Health Science Center. Um, she's a member of the Biggs uh, Institute, right? Your founding member. I have very few notes because we're, we have a tight schedule today. If you haven't seen the schedule, so our introductions are going to be short. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Alicia Parker um, to talk to us about overview of Alzheimer's and what's to come next. So thank you, Dr. Parker, for taking time out on Sunday and on Saturday morning. I don't even know what day. <laughs> So if you uh, get to the point where you can't hear me, just point it out, okay? So I'm Alicia Parker. I'm an assistant professor over at UT Health San Antonio on cognitive and behavioral neurology. So I specialize in treating memory disorders. And I am the clinic director for the Boots Institute as well. So today, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about what Alzheimer's is, how you diagnose it and treat it, and then a little bit about PAPS research and some new avenues that are opening for research. Okay. Who's the next slide there? The disclosures I have are just that I'm involved with a number of research studies. It doesn't actually pay me anything more, <laughs> but it does account for some of the percent of time that I spend working on. I move past that as well. So, on overview today, uh, we're going to talk about what's normal for a person's memory as they age. Um, then we're going to talk about what mild cognitive impairment or MCI is, what dementia is, and what Alzheimer's is. And then we're going to discuss the status of research, what's happened before and what's coming up. So with typical aging, what's normal is that a person can have a slower processing speed. So the rate in which a person thinks can slow down a little bit. And it's also quite normal for there to be more trouble with naming, recalling names of people that you don't see quite as often or having trouble pulling out a word. Anything outside of that is actually not typical aging. And it's probably due to some kind of medical problem, which ought to be investigated. So we have a couple of cognitive impairment syndromes. Cognitive just meaning a person's ability to think. Uh, and they're very big let's say. So it's mild cognitive impairment or MCI. It just means that a person is having some trouble with their thinking, but not enough trouble that they can't function. So a person with MCI has a little trouble with their memory or their thinking in some way, but they're still able to do everything they used to do. It might just be a little slower and a little harder. A person with dementia <clears throat> has enough trouble with their thinking that they're not functioning quite as well. They need a little more help. Essentially, anything affecting the brain can cause mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And so, um, the things like Alzheimer's disease, for example, can cause mild cognitive impairment if you have mild memory loss. And if it's more advanced, you can lead into dementia. But really, anything affecting the brain can cause these two things. So, you have the neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies, premature dementia, and such. Um, things like traumatic brain injuries or hemorrhages or strokes, anything affecting the brain can cause cognitive impairment as I mentioned. And then we'll move to the next slide. Can we move to the next slide? Okay, wonderful. Uh, so just a little bit about Alzheimer's itself. Mm. So Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative disease that causes a gradual change in memory. For um, some overall facts, they're from the Alzheimer's Association's past <coughs> papers page. About one in three seniors die with Alzheimer's or another kind of dementia. And at present, we have more than six million Americans who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Actually, in Texas, there are close to half a million people suffering with Alzheimer's dementia, um, which is a huge problem. 
And then a problem on top of that is that there's maybe about 20 of us in behavioral neurology uh, specialized in treating memory disorders in the state. It's a really small field, so feel free to advocate for having more neurologists when you're at it with all of your Alzheimer's research. <coughs> um, let me see here. Uh, and then some other things that are important to notice are that uh, women actually are substantially more likely to get Alzheimer's than men, and we don't have a solid reason for why that happens. And that's also true with, with Hispanics. People of Hispanic backgrounds are also more likely to get Alzheimer's dementia. Let me get into the next slide again. So just a little bit about recognizing Alzheimer's. Uh, and people who have Alzheimer's disease, usually there's a gradual or an insidious um, trouble with short-term memory. So memory for recent events, like remembering conversations, remembering what happened the day before, where you went to, where you put your purse. And you know, everybody has little memory lapses, but this is something that's consistent, that doesn't go away, that's always there, that gradually is becoming more common. Um, and then usually over time, some of the next symptoms include having trouble with memory for directions, so getting lost, going to familiar places, uh, like getting to the grocery store or family member's house. Uh, and then over time, usually the next symptom after that is having some difficulty with orientation and time, so knowing what the date is, what the month is, what the year is. And this is just the most classic presentation. Um, but you know, people are very always consistently true. So if you're doing a memory evaluation, it's more than this. This is just some little snippets. Um, in clinic, you might have a cognitive screen done, usually a Moker, an MMSC, or there are a whole bunch of different ones that kind of give a widespread view of memory that only take like 15 or 20 minutes to do. Uh, you might also be sent for a neuropsychological evaluation, which is a couple hours long, and it's much more expensive. Um, so these are just little snippets of something called the MOCA memory screen, which stands for Montreal Pattern Assessment. And people with Alzheimer's, we have a couple of the short-term memory. And so when you ask people to remember five words, like the ones that are listed over on the top left there, which was Space Velvet Church Daisy Red, people with Alzheimer's would have trouble remembering those words after a little bit of time, and giving them some clues wouldn't help. Um, <coughs> And then uh, if you're trying to check their visual short-term memory, like you're having them copy a picture like those intersecting pen bones, and you ask them to remember it later, that visual memory task will also be difficult. So you can see in this example, the person drew some diamonds rather than pentagons. So that was a little trouble with the visual short-term memory. Uh, and then there often is a little trouble with the parietal lower functions that kind of help with visual spatial things like the directions but also things like being able to draw and copy geometric figures. The medical word for that is um, constructional apraxia. And then also on the memory testing, there can be some trouble with orientation. So if you're asking things like the date, the month, the year, uh, that can be difficult as well. So that constellation of having trouble with the memory, the orientation, and kind of visual spatial things is what happens in the most typical presentations of Alzheimer's. You can go to the next slide. And so it's always better to do brain imaging. Um, just because you localize if there's trouble with the short-term memory, that just means there's trouble with the temporal lobes, basically, in the brain, but it doesn't really tell you why. So it's better always to do imaging, just to make sure what's there is what you think it is. Um, so in Alzheimer's disease, what you see in imaging is atrophy, uh, meaning that the brain tissue shrinks, it gets smaller from their degeneration. So that picture on the left, the arrow is pointing to where there's hippocampal atrophy or temporal atrophy. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that helps with your short-term memory. Um, and so you can compare that over to the picture on the right, which is the normal brain. You can see that area that the, area that the uh, arrow is pointing to is fuller. Um, and whereas the one on the left, the Alzheimer's brain, uh, has some shrinkage from their degeneration in those temporal areas. Yeah. And then on some occasions, your physicians might want to get more imaging cash, just that structural imaging with either the CT scan or the MRI. 
Uh, and so you can get something called a metabolic PET scan, and a PET scan that looks at glucose metabolism. Um, and in that scan, even if the structure of the brain looks full and there's not much atrophy or brain shrinkage, like the one on the left here, the one on the right shows you the how active uh, metabolically the brain areas are, with um, high areas of activity being warmer, better colors. <coughs> And y'all can see where the arrow is pointing to, which is the temporal lobes that is less active. It has not so much of the warmer colors. It's more of a blue-green, less metabolically active, which is what you see with Alzheimer's in that area. Uh, another imaging biomarker, so a biomarker just meaning something that shows you a disease is there or how it progresses, some characteristic about that medical problem. Uh, is a different kind of a PET scan called an amyloid or an amyloid PET. <coughs> which uh, specifically looks for the amyloid protein that happens with Alzheimer's disease. Um, if you could click twice just to make all the <coughs> words come up now. Go forward twice. One more time. OK, good. <laughs> <laughs> so with the amyloid PET scans, they're not currently approved by insurance, but there is a research study called New Ideas Ongoing, <clears throat> essentially to try to demonstrate that it would be helpful uh, clinically to be able to say, yes, this is Alzheimer's, or this is not Alzheimer's. Um, <clears throat> people who are cognitively normal, meaning no trouble with memory, can have amyloid in their brain, and so can people with Alzheimer's and Lewy body disease. The amyloid PET scan really rules out and Alzheimer's if the amyloid is not there. So if you have somebody with memory loss and there's no amyloid on the PET scan, then it's not Alzheimer's. Uh, that imaging study currently is about six to eleven thousand dollars out of pocket. <laughs> Feel free to ask for that one too. Uh, with the there's one research study ongoing called New Ideas that's trying to help people get that one, um, and so people who are able to enroll in that research get it uh, at no cost. Okay, we can move on. There are other biomarkers that can help um, confirm Alzheimer's in life. Whereas in the past, it used to only be diagnosable after a person died and um, donated the brain or did a brain autopsy to look at the proteins that were there. <coughs> there is a, a method of obtaining some cerebral spinal fluid, so the fluid that goes around the brain and the spine. Uh, you can collect a little bit of it and look for the amyloid in the tail see what that ratio is and that can give you an indication of if Alzheimer's is present. Um, that test is also about $1,500 out of pocket. It's, none of these things are really covered by insurance at present. This is my ongoing battle with insurance, basically. I'm sorry, everybody has involved in insurance here. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, uh, and then very recently, just a couple months ago, uh, a group out of the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis developed a blood test that also looked for some of the proteins in Alzheimer's, which seems pretty sensitive, like about 88% sensitive, um, for picking up Alzheimer's changes. <laughs> that one is also about $1,500 at present. Okay. So with Alzheimer's disease, the medicines that we currently have help slow down the symptom of memory loss. So they don't stop it, they don't make it go away, and they don't have the ability to grow the brain back, but they help to stabilize things as much as possible, to slow down the rate of change in memory, to give people more lives with, um, sorry, more years with better quality so that they stay functional for longer. And there's two broad classes, the cholinesterase inhibitors, like denethazil or aricept, and then also rubastamine, which is axolol and galantamine. Um, that are used to that purpose, and we're not going to go too far into this and go say, let's go to the next slide here. And the second category of medicines for Alzheimer's is those that work on something called NMDA, um, which helps uh, kind of slow down some of the changes in plasticity in the brain. <coughs> and that is a medicine called Memetine. People with Alzheimer's can get a lot of associated symptoms. It can be quite common for there to be more irritability or frustration or anxiety. There's a whole host of medicines that can be helpful that are mild <coughs> and otherwise. And I would generally avoid giving a person with Alzheimer's sedating medicines or medicines that might make them confused.
confused. Um, I wish there's a whole class there too. So uh, on lungs, I usually check that a bunch of different electrolytes and things like the hormone, thyroid hormones, and a couple of vitamins that are important uh, are in good ranges. But if they're not in good ranges, it's best to figure out how much you should actually take. Because um, you don't want anything to be too high or too low. You want it to be in a nice physiologic range. Um, there's a touch of evidence for curcumin and omega-3s being helpful, but about those, the levels that are in all the different supplements aren't really regulated, so it's probably better to see fish a couple times a week. Uh, there's a, a little bit of evidence for having diets similar to the Mediterranean diet, and then there's quite a bit of evidence for taking good care of your cardiovascular health. So getting regular aerobic activity, um, trying to stay physically active, there's actually some evidence that getting something like 30 minutes of aerobic activity a day can push back the weight loss by like three years or so. As well. uh -huh. So with Alzheimer's, it's always important, basically, to have a good team approach, and part of that is the different therapies. Uh, doing something called cognitive speech therapy for memory exercise can be helpful for some people. Uh, it can be nice to have an occupational therapist go out and check out the home and see what can be changed to make a person more functional and independent. Um, similarly, with the home safety evaluations that. Uh, essentially, it's to have the occupational therapist go out and see how things are set up and what can be made better. Um, some people with Alzheimer's have trouble with the uh, posterior parts of the brain that help with understanding vision. And so it can be helpful to um, touch base with the low vision clinic. <clears throat> and then some people can have a tremor as well. Very good things to do. Oh, close enough. <laughs> and then, uh, also in the therapies, with physical therapy, uh, the physical therapist can help with walking, balance, kind of teaching a person to <coughs> do as much as they can to stay upright and not falls. So those can all either be done at outpatient clinics or there are a bunch of different home health companies uh, where the therapist can come out to the patient's house, provided that patient uh, doesn't drive themselves and is home bound. Okay, now we're good. <laughs> So um, along with that team approach, I think it's really nice to have a good clinical team. So to have a neurologist and a primary care doctor, sometimes the geriatric primary care doctors, those that specialize in treating older patients, will be a little bit more familiar with dementia. Um, it's really important to have a social worker on board. Uh, it's also really good to have a counselor and all the therapists. The neuropsychologists are very helpful in diagnosing. Um, different kinds of cognitive problems. There are a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms like we talked about, like the irritability and the frustration and such. And it can be helpful to have a geriatric psychiatrist on board, so that's a psychiatrist who's more specialized to treat older people. <clears throat> and then also having a patient navigator, so a person who uh, talks to the patients about um, what research studies are available, if they have any interest in getting hooked into the research settings. Go to the next slide. Okay, so we're going to take a pause there uh, and talk about some of the past things in Alzheimer's research and then some of the upcoming things. <clears throat> For the past couple of decades, most of the research has been studied or has been focused on the amyloid and the catalyst found in the brains of people with Alzheimer's <clears throat> with um, a lot of success in the second. Uh, and so there's a few more avenues to look at on uh, those realms. And then there's also actually uh, a huge number of other pathways that are being studied now as well. So there's a lot happening in the field. Okay. okay. Um, so in the past, going back to the 1990s, uh, there have been a variety of different classes of medicines that successfully decrease the amyloid protein in the brain. But for the most part, in the studies that were done, that didn't result in people having less difficulty with their memory. Mm -hmm. There are still a few things that are ongoing with that, um, and that most of those uh, anti-amyloid medicines were tested in people with more advanced dementia, mm -hmm. with more advanced Alzheimer's. <laughs> and so some of the ongoing studies 
are more geared towards people with either just very mild symptoms of Alzheimer's or no current symptoms of Alzheimer's, but they're at high risk. But the purpose of kind of trying to stop that inflammatory neurodegenerative cascade from happening. And so that's the direction most of these studies are going towards. Okay, and then let's go to the next slide. We're going to just briefly touch upon adipanumab, which is the same thing as adenine. Um, <clears throat> that was a monoclonal antibody that uh, decreases amyloid in the brain, which it does successfully. It was given an accelerated approval by the FDA last year on the basis that it does decrease the amyloid plaques. And the FDA, with that accelerated approval, which is essentially a partial approval, uh, the company Biogen was asked to um, do further studies to make sure there was a clinical benefit. Okay? So it was not actually proven at the time it was approved. Um, and there were a few things with it. So the the two large trials that had been done, called the Engage and Emerge, uh, were done identically, but just one of them had a statistically significant benefit of the adipanumab with it uh, slightly slowing down the rate of memory loss. Um, but that was not replicated in their other identical trial. So they found that in the Emerge trial, but not the Engage trial. And when the FDA statistician put all the data together, it didn't actually Look significant, let's say. Uh, and then it, some more things came about about the safety data. And actually, a, a large number of patients had significant side effects. So those side effects are called ARIA, or amyloid-related imaging abnormalities. But what that works out to is brain swelling, which is that picture on the left, and microhemorrhages, which is the picture on the right, which is a little bleeding in the brain. Um, you know, I'm a cautious person. And so that makes me just a little bit weary. And that's not everyone, and it was infrequent for this to cause serious complications. But, um, and so it is uh, still being studied and might be helpful in some of the people who have the earlier memory loss, as long as it's close to study, as in these people need to get their MRIs every three months. <clears throat> and they need to be genotyped for ApoE4, which is just a factor that makes a person more likely to have side effects. Uh, and in that setting, I think it could be a safely administered medicine. It just needs to be closely monitored. Um, <clears throat> one of the other physicians in our group had people on it came out uh, in the earlier studies, and he felt they really did do better. So again, it's just a, a medicine that needs to have really close oversight. Uh, so in any case, the, the Centers for uh, Medicare Services, which basically is the foundation for all the other insurance companies deciding to approve or disapprove something. I decided to approve Adekanab just for clinical trials, suggesting that it needed to be studied a little bit more, which in the context of everything, I think was a reasonable decision. All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay. Um, so uh, there's also been a bunch of studies that looked at the tau protein, which is also a protein found in the brain cells. And um, uh, that field has also been moving towards looking at these tau medicines in people who have just mild symptoms of memory loss. Uh, a lot of them are currently ongoing. We'll have results published in the next couple of years or so. Um, one of them uh, that interacts with some of the downstream effects of tau, called the Lemmy Beauty and Tree Tea study, is happening at the Lakes Institute. We'll talk about that one as well later. So, this is uh, a really nice slide, y'all. This is from two years ago, and so there are more things added since then. <laughs> but this is just the um, all of the different medicines and clinical trials that are happening in the field of Alzheimer's. So at present, or rather in 2020, there were 121 different medicines that were being tested in 136 different trials. So the field of Alzheimer's research is huge and has expanded tremendously in even just the last five to 10 years, which is wonderful, uh, after a lot of advocacy and efforts to make that happen. Um, if y'all take a look at this uh, graph here, the upper wedge that looks green 
is uh, more of the medicines that focus on amyloid and tau. The purple wedge is all of the kind of new pathways that are being investigated. And then the orange wedge is uh, medicines that look at some of the associated symptoms with Alzheimer's. Um, <clears throat> the outer ring are the phase one trials, or the earliest trials, where uh, in a clinical study, the purpose is to see if the medicine is safe, basically. So where the medicine is just given to a small amount of people, and then side effects are, are looked for and managed. And then in the phase two trials, which is that middle ring, um, a, larger uh, a larger number of people are enrolled, uh, and the purpose is to see what a good dose is as well, and to start looking at efficacy or how effective a uh, medicine is. And then in the final kind of stage of clinical trials, which is the phase three, um, that's where you say you have a better handle on what the side effects are, if there are any, uh, and then how effective it is. Um, and so really there's so many medicines and so many different pathways that are under development right now that I'm personally really hopeful about the future that will have more good things come out that we can work with and hopefully help people with and treat people with so that we can get a better handle on this really difficult disease process. Okay, and then next slide. <clears throat> so I thought I would just real quickly show you a couple of the clinical research studies that we have on going into the Bates Institute. Um, this is not a complete list. If we did a complete list, we'd really be here all day, and there's only so long you guys are supposed to be talking in. <laughs> uh, but if you want later, there is a, a UT Health San Antonio booth over in the um, booth area that has all different packets that you can pick up. and. Um, some contact information for our patient research navigator. Her name's Melissa Zamora. She's really nice. And she's uh, able to talk about and meet with the, anybody who's interested about the different research opportunities. <clears throat> so broadly, uh, with clinical research, there is observational research to learn more about the disease process. And then there is clinical trials where patients who have the disease uh, can enroll in a study medicine is given, more or less. <clears throat> so in terms of observational research to learn more about disease, disease processes, because um, really a, a lot is uh, still not known about Alzheimer's. <clears throat> um, a lot of the time we don't know why it happens to specific people or what alters the trajectory for how that disease process goes or what medicines might be most effective. And so that itself is very much an area of active study. So with observational research, um, over the Bates Institute, we started something called the Bates Biobank, where uh, people, anyone really, can uh, donate some of their saliva or blood or cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, and then those people, in some instances, can also do condom assessments. And that's pretty much to build a repository for research, so we can just learn about more learn more about what's normal, what's not normal, what happens with Alzheimer's, so that we can get a better handle on what treatments might be more effective. There is also a, a brain donation program where um, anyone that wanted to, not necessarily just Alzheimer's, uh, but any person at all can donate their brain after they pass away. Um, <laughs> which is a, a really wonderful gift to science to learn more about Alzheimer's and what happens in those brains compared to people who don't have Alzheimer's and where those changes lie. Um, and those things are both free, it doesn't cost anything. Um, and I just mentioned that because with brain donations uh, at many other places that actually cost like $3,000 to get an autopsy report about the proteins that are present in a person's brain. So, not right now, guys, obviously. <laughs> but if y'all ever wanted to think about donating your brains, like donating your organs after passing, it's, it would be a nice thing to do for other people to try to push the field for it. So coming over to clinical trials. With clinical trials, that's where a, a, a 
patient or a participant is given either a study medicine or a placebo um, to kind of tell how the study medicine is doing. Most of those clinical trials require a study partner or a caregiver um, to be present as well, just because a lot of times people with Alzheimer's have trouble remembering what they're forgetting, and so it's better to have a, another person there with them. And a lot of those require the memory medicines to be at stable doses for some time before the research starts, most often between three to six months. And there is a rather detailed uh, criteria for being able to enroll in a study, which is going to be a little bit different for each thing. Um, we're just going to broadly talk about it at the moment. Okay. We can go forward with them. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about the Lamy Moody Near 3 p study, which is called RBB. <coughs> that um, particular study is geared towards people with mild symptoms of Alzheimer's so mild memory loss. Uh, the Lamy Moody drug actually was developed as an antiretroviral medicine for HIV and hepatitis. It works kind of by um, preventing the genes in the brain cells from moving around and getting disorganized and not working as well. Uh, it's usually a, a mild, well tolerated medicine, it's just a daily pill. <clears throat> and that uh, study is geared towards people who are, are a little bit older in their 50s to 80s uh, that are, can be on the cholinesterase medicines like denethazone or aerosin, but cannot be on the limitine. Um, and then that study <clears throat> uh, is over 24 weeks duration and requires things like memory tests and blood tests and uh, it does require a lumbar puncture to get a look at the cerebral spinal fluid to make sure the medicine is actually getting to the brain as it needs to. Okay, um, but I have a few people in that one that's going to be doing well for what it's worth. <coughs> Same thing with the REACH study, uh, which similarly is uh, geared towards people with mild symptoms of Alzheimer's. And that is what the study uh, medicine called rapamycin which effectively helps decrease neuroinflammation and it seems to help decrease some of the neuroplasticity changes that happen. Um, some of the earlier phase studies look good and so it's moving on to the later stage studies at the moment it's in a phase three, which is the last one. Okay, and then we can keep going again. Right, and then also there's the STOMP AD study, um, which is looking at medicines that are called synolytic medicines. So, Sino meaning senescence or kept on quiet and lit it uh, as a stop for the cut. So, the medicines wake up the cells that have gone to sleep from Alzheimer's disease to make the brain more active. <clears throat> and that also seems to be going well as a daily pill that one would take. Um, but it seems to just be causing very mild side effects at best. Okay, now we can keep going again. Mm -hmm. And then there's other research outside of medicines or medical treatments. Uh, we recently were able to start a study that looked at deep brain stimulation um, in people with mild symptoms of memory loss. And so, uh, have you all ever heard of deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease, yeah. where a little bit of electrical current goes to the movement areas in the brain? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's actually a brain surgery to implant something like a pacemaker in the brain. And um, that can be helpful in Parkinson's disease to make the movement better. Uh, and it's in the beginning stages in memory disorders. But the hope is that in putting that uh, device that's kind of like a pacemaker into a memory area that they call the fornix, that it could help those memory areas work a little bit better. Okay. And then. All right, and that was where I was going to end, because I was going to leave some room for questions here. Uh, but if y'all ever want to contact us, that top number is just the overall number for the Biggs Institute. So, what's up? Where is the Biggs Institute? Oh, sure. <laughs> so we're part of UT Health San Antonio. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, no? No, no worries at all. I probably should have mentioned that earlier. Uh, so the Glenn Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases. Mm -hmm. It's part of ET Health San Antonio, where the Mark Clinical Building, which is 8300 for the girl, mm -hmm. Mark stands for Medical Arts and Research Center. ET does love abbreviations. <laughs> uh, so we're close by here, just a couple miles. Um, mm -hmm. 
And that top number, the 210-450-9960, is the overall number where you would call if you were trying to access the clinic or uh, if you were trying to get an appointment. If you were trying to look at the clinical research, I'd probably call Melissa Zamora, a patient navigator. And her number was just below at 210-450-9742. All right. Yeah. Do you have to be uh, referred by the neurologist or can the primary physician do it? Or do you just do it? I don't know if you heard. So you have to be referred by a neurologist, is that what you said? Yeah, can the primary physician or primary care physician refer to the base institute? Generally just having a primary care referral is sufficient. Primary care. Mm -hmm.
Um, I was when I came in late, and did y'all talk about the studies that were done on the amyloid that were false? Yes. Uh, y'all did already talk about. Okay. Did you talk about Lyme disease? Okay. Not overly, oh, really? but we can mention that for a minute. Okay. So Lyme disease is also something that has been studied with Alzheimer's and just about every other medical problem. And while there are some people who can get Lyme disease to the point where it directly impacts the brain and causes something like an encephalitis, I personally don't think it's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. When you look at very broad national studies, uh, the overlay of the incidence of Lyme disease and the incidence of Alzheimer's, they don't directly link up or correlate. And so they don't seem to be directly associated with each other. Okay, go over here real quick. Sure. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I can check. In the uh, walking donor situation, yeah. if you have on your license, driver's license, that you're an organ donor, mm -hmm. do, do the people who take your organs know that your brain is also included? Or is that special? <laughs> so that's, uh, it's, it's special, I'd say it's a little different. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be an organ donor and have that on your driver's license. And what that means if you're an organ donor <clears throat> is that um, as you pass away from whatever happened, uh, if your organs are in good shape, they can be donated to be given to people who are alive to keep to replace their organs that are failing. Uh, whereas if you're doing something like donating your body to science, it goes to, yeah, somebody wants to go. At the moment, we don't have the ability to do a, a brain transplantation. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have a question from our online audience, and it says Can these biomarkers be procedural or general checkups in the future to screen for Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's kind of where that field is going to. So we're trying to make it so that uh, people can get better biologic diagnoses of Alzheimer's, so that they can have some proven amyloid or tau problems in their brain, like the blood test or the CSF test or the imaging study with the amyloid PET scan. Um, because other things can look like Alzheimer's and not really be Alzheimer's. There are a whole bunch of other diseases that look real similar. And it's best to just make sure you're treating what you think you're treating, so that people are getting the the treatment and the medicines they need. So yeah, the a major purpose of the biomarkers is to make them more clinically available. Yeah. Are the symptoms? Oh, hold on, let's hang out with Myron in the microphone. Well, go ahead. What do you have? <laughs> oh, I just wondered for the Alzheimer's is it showing up at the same ages for men and women, or is there a fact different fact? Are they ages? Or is it showing up at the same age with men and women? Question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, between men and women, the ages that people get Alzheimer's are pretty similar and increases uh, every year with age. Um, so that in and of itself between the genders isn't really too different. It's just that women have a little bit of a higher risk overall of developing Alzheimer's. Hi, I have a question in regards to research studies. If I wanted to, or my mother was interested in research studies, is it just clinical drug studies, or are there other studies or observational studies? And if so, uh, I guess some other requirements. Uh, she's not on a lot of medication. I know some people are on several medications. How is that possible? Sure. So there, um, there are clinical trials with study medicines, and there are also observational trials just to learn more about and the disease processes. So at the Mix Institute at UT Hall San Antonio, where I'm at, we have the biobank where people can donate their um, blood or their saliva or their cerebral spinal fluid so that we can get a, a good look at the biomarkers. There's also something called the NAC or the National Alzheimer's Cohort. Um, 
and which people's memory is kind of tracked over time to see how they do with all the different biomarkers that are collected, just so that we can learn more. <coughs> um, and then there's also the brain donation program that we looked at. Uh, those observational trials, for the most part, are open to anybody. You don't have to be a person who has Alzheimer's disease, and it doesn't really matter what your other medical problems are. Uh, those just exist to learn more about Alzheimer's in the broader context of, let's say, everything. <laughs> um, if you go to the ET Health San Antonio booth, there'll be some more uh, informational cards and things you can pick up there. <laughs> my, my question is that we, we had uh, someone from the Alzheimer's the other day come to our center, yeah. and she, she talked about it a lot of times if you have uh, uh, reoccurs and UTIs about them that, that could sometimes show like, false uh, signs of Alzheimer's. Or... Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, that was about if UTIs can cause false signs of Alzheimer's. Um, UTIs being urinary tract infections. So uh, in some people who um, are more at risk for something called delirium, you can get a lot of confusion and disorientation, sometimes hallucinations and things, when there's another medical problem happening. So with urinary tract infections, there's a higher rate of uh, kind of inflammation throughout the body, and the brain can have a harder time coping with that and not function as well. And so you can get more confusion and disorientation, and that's what the delirium is that's being caused by the urinary tract infection. For the most part, it's people who are, uh, have some neurodegeneration in their brains already that can have more trouble with delirium and are more prone to getting delirium. Um, just because their, their brain is not as easily able to cope with the body not doing well. And so if a person's getting delirium from a UTI, <coughs> a lot of times the delirium will uh, get better over some days or some weeks in kind of a fluctuating way where sometimes they're better than other times. Um, but people who get delirium ought to do a memory assessment because they actually are in high risk for having Alzheimer's. Okay. One here and one over there. I wanted to ask about the observational studies that you were talking about. So would the participant be made aware of any biomarkers that are discovered in, during those studies? So, uh, eventually. <laughs> uh, usually not immediately with all the research studies. Um, usually it waits for all the data to be collected and assimilated and analyzed which can take some time. Okay, thank you. I have two separate questions. Sure. The first is, what research has been done and what do we know about Alzheimer's being like hereditary? Mm -hmm. And then the second is, what kind of research has been done on how COVID has affected dementia and Alzheimer's? What information do we have about whether or not it's accelerating the process or if it's creating different kinds of complications when it comes to Alzheimer's and dementia. Sure. So uh, with the first question about genetic susceptibility to Alzheimer's, that is a pretty broad question. So the, there are a couple of genes that are very strongly heritable, meaning just that everybody in the family gets Alzheimer's. And that is uh, mutations in something called amyloid precursor protein and something called presenilin. Uh, and with those specific genes, people have an age of onset of Alzheimer's, so they get their trouble with their memory in their 40s and 50s for the most part. And so it's those early onset ones that are more strongly hereditable. There are <coughs> um, an increasing number of genes that find that increased one's risk for later onset Alzheimer's that are a lot less inheritable. Uh, of those, the one that is probably the most inheritable is something called uh, APOE, for your APOE alone. The um, APOE protein functions in the brain actually to transport around cholesterol. Uh, <clears throat> and people can have three kinds of variants of that APOE, APOE2, APOE3, or APOE4. 
four. Um, three is the most common in people, and four is the least common. People who have an ABOE4 LLO2 have an increased risk of Alzheimer's overall, <clears throat> and that works out basically to an increased risk later in life. So, uh, and you get your ABOE4 LLOs from your parents, one from your mother, one from your father. People who have one ABOE4 LLO have about a two to three times increased overall lifetime risk of Alzheimer's, and people with two E4 LLOs have a, about a 12 times increased risk overall of Alzheimer's. But that works out to getting Alzheimer's when they're older as well. And then uh, every year, basically, we discover more new genes that have just a little tiny bit, let's say, of an increased risk for getting Alzheimer's overall. So that was the first part. And then the second question was about COVID, and if it's also increasing one's risk for dementia and cognitive impairment. And a lot of that isn't known currently, just because COVID is so new. Um, we do know that we do know that uh, COVID, uh, the coronavirus, can directly uh, infect the brain, although that doesn't seem quite as common. We know that there can be some, like a kickoff of an autoimmune process or an inflammatory process, and some people who have COVID that can affect the brain as well. Um, it looks like the people who have persistent loss of smell after getting COVID have an increased risk for having trouble with the memory down the line. Uh, your ability to smell kind of directly links the outside of your body to your brain because you have um, the smells or different gases and things come up through the nose and then hook up to your olfactory neuron that just goes right back actually to the part of the brain next to the memory areas. Uh, and so, that is something that's just being actively studied. It's a whole other giant topic. But there's a, a whole ton of research right now that's being studied with COVID and later cause of dementia. Um, and it's possible to find they're related. And things like the 1918 influenza pandemic, there was a pretty high rate, actually, of people who had that initial influenza vaccine developing uh, Parkinson's disease afterwards. Um, and this is not the influenza we have today, that initial influenza from 1918, let's say, watered down over time, uh, uh, as the people that it very dramatically affected didn't live on to cross it. Um, and so there are documented instances of some viruses leading to neurodegeneration later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry not to stress everybody out. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Parker, yeah. I heard that uh, the Biggs is having some really good plans for the future. I understand they're, they're going to, I don't know if we've talked about this already, it's going to be really late, but I understand they're going to have a facility that's going to be built that's going to be like a one-stop mm -hmm. shop for dementia. Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Sure. Uh, so that question was just about some of the future things with the Biggs Institute and about the facility that would be a one-stop shop for taking care of people with uh, memory problems. So yeah, we're very excited about that. Um, last year, the Texas leg legislature put aside some funds to create a, a building called the Great Health Building that will be part of UT Health San Antonio where the Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases will be housed that will be like a comprehensive center for people with memory disorders, which will be really lovely. Um, so that will be just next to the Mark Clinical Building where we're currently located. Uh, and it will be right nearby the clinical research areas and some of the other research labs and such. Um, so I'm, I'm the chair of the <coughs> But it's going to be actually quite neat. The first floor is going to be more of a community area. We'll be able to do things like lectures and have support groups and get togethers. And then there'll also be a multidisciplinary clinic where we have things like physical therapy and speech therapy, occupational therapy, nutrition, genetics, counseling, social work. Um, and then also radiology will be there. And then the second floor will be the 
memory disorder center where people in behavioral neurology and patients for memory disorders and with parapsychology that helps with that diagnosis. Um, and then that floor, uh, oh, actually that's the third floor. And then the second floor just below that will have an infusion center for people on clinical trials or that are getting monthly infusions, which is going to overlook the meditation garden. Uh, and then there'll also be a big clinical research area for all the different clinical trials. And then on the fourth floor, there's going to be the neurology department for all the other neurology problems. <coughs> there's also going to be a big section for a geriatrics department, so geriatrics primary care. So we can all work closely together to keep a handle on things. Um, so I'm really excited about our ability to put all those things right together so that we can really provide that comprehensive care that benefits people. Yeah, thank you for asking about it. Great question. Okay, last question here. A uh, question from the online community asks, if you pay for a study to predict if you will get Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. will this affect trying to get a life insurance policy or obtaining future jobs? In other words, could this newfound information hurt you? It's not supposed to be because your medical information is supposed to be protected and private. That being said, things uh, change sometimes. And so if you're at risk for getting a neurodegenerative disease, it's kind of a bit of a personal choice trying to figure out if you're at risk and wanting to have the diagnosis. Because uh, I don't know that I could completely guarantee that it wouldn't adversely affect you in the future, which does make things rather difficult. That's a bit just, uh, that is something that's probably better to have a conversation with with a genetics doctor, so that they can go through all the ramifications of the particular thing you're looking for, uh, and what's going on with that particular person. All right, well, yes. we are up against our time yeah, Oh my goodness. Thank you, Dr. Parker, for And now, Dr. Parker, you give us the bad news, and then you give us some hope. So thank you for that. that was excellent. Yeah, you know, I just want to say thank you all for having me here. I'm honored to be here. There is a, a lot of hope. You know, we did have more than 120 medicine that are being studied and all new pathways that haven't been looked at before. So I personally am full of hope, but I hope you appreciate it. Your presentation was fantastic, but we also appreciate your patience with our technical issues. So that was that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> that was incredible. Let me try and turn off this microphone so I'm not talking on two. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you guys, and again, thank you, Dr. Parker. That was fantastic. Um, again, the UT. Um, program does have a booth in our community partners room so if you want to learn more about everything that they're doing it's fantastic um, and then of course they are actually are presenting this afternoon to talk about some of their um, caregiving programs so caring for the caregiver